Mm. Hmm? A little girl did. Somebody come in front of me. Okay, because I, I felt somebody walk by, and I thought, and I opened my eyes, and I didn't see anybody. Mm. I mean, uh, it's not uncommon for God to do strange things. To us, they're strange. And so I thought I'd just check with y'all before I went out on a limb there. Okay, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Who's glad to be in the house of God today? Hallelujah. Oh, I don't know about y'all, but I had a long week. I know Brother Chad said he's had an interesting week, a trying week, and uh, I know he's glad to be back in the house of God today. That's why they call this a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a place where you can escape and can't nobody bother you. You ever heard of a bird sanctuary? I mean, you can't go in there and go, you can't go in there and go bird hunting. Hallelujah. Well, there ain't no saint hunting here today. Hallelujah. We're safe. We're safe. We're safe when we go out, but we just don't realize it sometimes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I just, I just want to encourage you guys to keep up the praise. The word of God has the, uh, been shared with me over the past day is not what we're going to preach. It's going to be part of what we preach. But uh, they came, the children of Israel came before the Lord in the book of Judges and inquired how they should go about this battle. He said, send Judah first, the tribe of Judah. Send them first. Well, the word Judah means praise. He said, send the praisers first. Hallelujah. You see, faith is the doorway that leads to the promises of God, the blessings of God, the miracles of God. But praise is the key that opens that door. Hallelujah. Send Judah first and the battle will be won. Send Judah first and the foe is overcome, giving glory to the Father and glory to the Son. Send Judah first. We used to sing that years ago. Hallelujah. I know Brother Gene remembers it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Me and Brother Gene used to go to church together a long time ago. Didn't we, Brother Gene? <laughs> we sure did. Hallelujah. Well, if you have your Bibles, then I pray you do. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, going in a different direction than we did last week. Last week I felt like uh, God was burning my heart up, burning my heart and turning my heart to say the things I said last week. I make no apology for anything said last week. Hallelujah. Well, I think some things need to be set straight in the church. We need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. We need to know who we are in God. Hallelujah. So many churches don't even have any statement of faith or anything, what they believe. And they just come in and everybody believes everything. Well, that's not what it is. God's word says something and it means something. And, it, and it, there is a truth there. And we have taken these truths out and said, we're going to believe these things. And that's what, that's what makes us who we are. So, so we need to be careful with that. Okay, we're going to pick up in verse 12. If y'all would, stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to read from 12 to the end of the chapter. I think y'all can stand for 10 verses. Hallelujah. And honor God's Word. Hallelujah. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all his house all the house of Israel, brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, who was David's wife, looked through a window and saw the king, David, leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed it among the people 
among the whole multitude of Israel, both women and men, to every one a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore I will play before the Lord. And I will be even more undignified than this. And I will humble myself of my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. And you may be seated. <coughs> we pick up where we left off last week. We find him bringing the ark of God back to Israel after being gone 40 some years. We find him putting it on a new cart, which wasn't the way God instructed to do it. We find the oxen stumbling, the cart shaking. A man named Uzzah reaching out and touching the ark and God striking him dead because you ain't supposed to touch the ark and you ain't supposed to carry it on a new cart. We find David perplexed and says, what will we do? And the place where the ark is stopped at was Obed-Edom's house. They took it into his house. Obed-Edom was a Levite. He was a priest. He knew how to care for the ark of God properly, and he did so. And because of that, his house was blessed immensely. Everything he done was blessed. Hallelujah. See, that's where you get your blessings from God. It ain't from naming it and claiming it. It's from being obedient. Come on, somebody. It's from being obedient to the word of God, to the unadulterated, inspired, infallible, authoritative, written word of God. Hallelujah. I stake my life on this book. I have staked my life on this book. I put my life and my soul on this book because I put them in his hands. Hallelujah. To walk by this book. To live by this book and to die by this book. Hallelujah. Well, Tommy, that's a little bit crazy. No, this, this is the way it needs to be, folks. Okay, but Obed-Edom, Obed he, he became a, a great man. He became a gatekeeper, we find out later on in the scripture, a musician and a doorkeeper for the ark. And he had eight sons who also served God in the temple. You see, Obed-Edom didn't stay in his house. When the presence of God left, he went with it. Come on, somebody. We can't stay where we're at, when God blesses us and sit and uh, think about the things that God has done and live in the past and the old days. Boy, I remember when God blessed me. You know why God blessed you? Because you're stuck sitting in the same place that you got blessed at. you got to get up and you got to move. And Obed-Edom moved with the ark. Hallelujah. And he was blessed because of it. In verse 9 of chapter 6, we find David was afraid of God because Uzzah had been stricken dead in the presence of God as he touched the ark. We, we find him afraid. But in verse 12, we find him glad because he saw what happened. He saw that when the ark of God was taken into Obed-Edom's house and taken care of properly and the rules and the commandments and the statutes of God will follow like they're supposed to be followed, that God's blessing followed that. Hallelujah. And David said to himself, I can imagine, wow, if I do it God's way, I'm going to be blessed too. Like I said, the ark symbolized the presence and the glory of God. It had been gone. Ichabod was written on the doorpost of the temple. It was gone. The presence and the glory of God was gone. That'd be like us coming to church without no presence of God, without no God to worship. Hallelujah. But that's not the case here. Hallelujah. Although I do believe there are churches across this nation, the Ichabod has been written on the doorpost, and God has departed. Thank God he's not left here. Hallelujah. We're not going to let him leave. I'm going to hang on to him. I'm going to grab the skirt of his garment just like that lady did. Hallelujah. I'm going to receive from him. Hallelujah. I'm going to bless him. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if we look at verse 13... We see it says, and so it was when those 
bearing the ark of the Lord. When those bearing the ark. What were they doing? They were bearing the ark. They were carrying it. That's what God said to do. He didn't say put it on a cart and drive it around. He said to bear it. He said that men were to bear the presence of God. We are to bear his presence. I said this last week. So men are bearing the presence of God. Like God said to do it. There was a blessing in doing it. If there's anything y'all ain't getting from the last two weeks, it's this right here. There's blessing for doing things the way God says do them. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. So verse 13, we see them bearing the ark. In contrast to verse 3, which it says they put it on a new cart. They did it God's way, and God's way always pays off. It said after they went six paces, they stopped and made sacrifice. David did. We, knew, we know about numerology in the Bible. We know that the numbers have meanings in the Bible. We talked about the number three a couple of times. You know, about, about three days that we're going to cross over the Jordan River. How number three is a sign of perfection, but not quite to the extent of seven. But it also means resurrection. What does six mean? I ain't going to make you turn there. But how many know what the mark of the beast, the number of the beast is? Six, six, six. And it didn't say that that was the mark of the beast or it was his number. It said it was number of a man. The number of man is six. So we find him making six paces. Hallelujah. And that's where David made sacrifice for the sins and the error committed by man. Six paces. Six is also the number of sorcery. It's the number used in sorcery. Uh, you'll find that there's six instances in the New Testament where sorcery is referred to or those who, who practice sorcery. Six times. And we talked about getting witchcraft out of the church, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's important, number six. But he, he made sacrifice for man's sin. Now see, and even though God demanded sacrifices in the Old Testament, how many of us know that that's not really what he wanted? No, no, he didn't really want that. Psalm 51 verse 17 said that the sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Hallelujah. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for somebody with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel told King Saul that to obey was to better, was better than to sacrifice. We've already talked about that. He said obedience is better than sacrifice. I'd rather have you obey me then go out and make a sacrifice. But see, that's what people do, ain't it? They go out and they see and they do what they want to do. They have it their way, kind of like Burger King, glory to God. They have it their way. And then they come back and they make a sacrifice. They put a big, big thing in the offering, you know. They do some kind of great thing, some kind of act of kindness, trying to appease God for what they've done wrong. When all they had to do was obey Him all along. And that's what He really wanted. He don't want the sacrifice. He wants the obedience. Let's be an obedient people. Let's be an obedient church today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans 12, 1. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Hallelujah. A living sacrifice. What does that mean? That means I'm dying, but I'm not dying. Hallelujah. That means I'm, I'm, there's, there's parts of me that's dying. There's things in me that are dying. The old man is dying. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Kill that sucker. I want the old man dead because he gives me a lot of trouble. You know, it's rough. It's, <laughs> it's rough having a split personality. How many know that's true? How many know you've got a split personality? Don't you look at me funny. Y'all got a split. Because y'all just like Jekyll I and I am just like Jekyll and Hyde. But you know what that is? That's the old man, the old sin nature that still dwells in us, trying to get control over the God nature in us. What you feed grows, what you starve dies. 
If you feed that old sin nature, that old sin man, by watching things, by saying things, by participating in things that are wrong, he's going to grow stronger and stronger, and your spirit man is going to be a little 90-pound weakling. How many remember Charles Atlas? Well, I don't remember him because he lived, he, he was dead before I was born, I believe. But, uh, but uh, I can remember being little, and Daddy used to get these sports of field hunting magazines. Man, I'd read them things. And uh, ain't it neat how when you're little, your imagination can just, you know, you can, you, I, can, I can see myself out tromping through the snow with my rifle hunting bear and moose in the northeast, northwest, great northwest. You know, I can just see me doing all those things. But in the, in the, they have these little ads in the back, and one of them was a Charles Atlas course. It was a method that you could become a he-man with. Well, I tell you what... Uh, I don't want to send off for that thing when I was little because I was a little skinny kid. And I'm not no he-man now. But uh, nevertheless, I was a little skinny kid. And I, I looked at that and I had a little cartoon with it. I had this little skinny fella laying on a beach towel beside his girlfriend and this big husky guy come by kicking sand up on him. You know. And I think then after that, it shows him coming back after the Charles Atlas course and taking care of the situation. <laughs> How many want their spirit man to be like the little skinny fellow laying on the, laying on the towel? No, we want, our, we want our spirit man to be strong. What you feed grows, what you starve dies. Hallelujah. You don't think it works? Look in the Garden of Eden. The serpent was a snake. Look in the book of Revelation, what is he? He's a dragon. Somebody's been feeding that sucker. Mm-hmm. Flesh. Flesh, that's what he's been eating. What you feed grows, what you starve dies. Hallelujah. Let's build up our spirit, man. Let's be living sacrifices. Laying on the altar, the crucible of God. Hearing that, hearing that flesh drop and hit the fire. You ever throw an old greasy hamburger on the grill? And you hear it splattering against the fire as it drops. That grease drops out. That's what we want God to cook all the bad out. Hallelujah. And what's left lives unto God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We could go on with that. We're going to move on now. Verses 14 and 15. We find David dancing before the Lord. Wearing a linen ephod. He was a king. Kings don't do this. Kings don't get out and act fool according to his wife. Kings have kingly robes that they wear. They sit in a high, exalted place because of their authority and their position. It says he's stripped down to a linen ephod. That's what the priests wore and those that served in the temple. He, Brother Chad and I were talking about this before church. It basically, he was in his underwear. Mm, come on, somebody. I consider myself an extravagant worshiper, but y'all don't want me to run around here in my underwear. No, y'all don't want that. <laughs> you talk about emptying a church out fast. <laughs> I can see you running for your life now. Hallelujah. That's right, brother. Hallelujah. It's, it's rough. I guarantee it. Yeah. But, uh, but I looked in the mirror this morning and thought, Phew. <laughs> I got to do something about some of this. But nevertheless, Sherry is good to me. Y'all know it. She's good to me. She's a good woman. Hallelujah. But he danced before God. See, when you realize your sin and you have repented of your sin, that's when true worship can begin. When you get things out. When you come to the place where you realize you're wrong and you repent of those things and you make things right with God, you do things God's way, that's when you can worship. And it said that he worshiped he danced with all of his might before the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He said everything from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Glory to God. He said everything that is within me, let it praise God. Hallelujah. If you read the Psalms, you'll find out David was a praiser. Hallelujah. He praised the Lord. But see, verse 16, 
talks about the ark coming back and David dancing before it and his wife Michael looking out of the window and seeing him leaping and whirling before the Lord and said she despised him. What is some truth in this? I want you to know. And I was convicted when I read this, partially. I consider myself a worshiper. I consider myself at times to be an extravagant worshiper. That song we just played for the offering. Your love is extravagant. We owe to Him extravagant praise. We owe to Him extravagant worship. We owe to Him a blessing with all that is within us. Is He worthy or not? Come on. Has He done something for you that's worthy of praise? I want you to know something. If he saved your soul and that's all he ever did, it was enough. It was enough. But he didn't stop there. He filled you with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. He's blessed your life with abundant blessing. Hallelujah. And ain't one of us sitting in this room can say, I ain't blessed. Because we are. Hallelujah. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of extravagant praise and extravagant worship. But I was convicted because we have to be careful looking at how other people praise God. And it may not be the way we praise Him. See, she was in that upper chamber. She was looking down. An old saying says she's looking down her nose at Him. That's what she did, wasn't it? She looked down. Well, actually, you ever heard this term? She was on the outside looking in. There's a whole different perspective when you're on the outside looking in. How many ever come to church and you're on the outside looking in? Somebody's up here being blessed, hallelujah. Somebody's up here laying in the floor, hallelujah. Or you've been to a teak meeting and they got sawdust all in their hair because of the, because the power of God's come all over them and because they fell out on the floor worshiping Him. Hallelujah. And you're back here sitting up here saying, look at them. Look at them putting that act on. They do this every Sunday and I'm getting tired of seeing it. You know, this time people got real around here. That's Michael. That's what she's doing. She's looking down on him. God forbid us forever looking at somebody else, praise and worship God and judge them according. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, we are not to judge our fellow Christians in their praise and worship. Stiff-necked people or churches that look down on somebody that's trying to give their all to God during worship is an abomination to God. I do believe that. See, we got, we got two things we look at here today. I'm always taking these scriptures and comparing them to the church and comparing them to us because they fit. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. You got a Michael church and you got a David church. Which church do you want to be? You want to be, a, you want to be a Michael church? Or do you want to be a David church? David was a man after God's own heart. I want to be a church after God's own heart. David extravagantly praised God. I want to extravagantly praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It also takes us back a few weeks. You can have a Martha church or you can have a Mary church. Come on, somebody. What do you want to be, a Martha church or a Mary church? I want to be a Mary church. I want to be sitting at the feet of Jesus, hallelujah, learning of him, hallelujah, taking his yoke upon me because it's easy and his burden is light, hallelujah. I want to be sitting in his face. I want some face time with Jesus, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. That's what I'm talking about. Glory to God. See? Uh-oh. I get mixed up with this little book here all the time, don't I? All right. In verse 17, it says they put the ark in the place, the tabernacle, that he had erected for it. In other words, they put God in his rightful place. That's where the, that's where the ark was supposed to dwell, was in the tabernacle. How many know that the Bible says what? Paul? Apostle Paul? Know ye not? Ye are the temple? of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price. So therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Know ye not, know ye not, ye are the temple. Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Filled with power, filled with praise, filled with glory. Hallelujah. You are the temple of God. And see, that's what we need to do. We need to put God in his rightful place. Hallelujah. Where he is supposed to be. Glory to God. We need to put him in the right place in our nation. Mm. We need to put him in the right place in our lives. Come on, somebody. We need to put him in the right place in our church. It's almost an oxymoron. And I know I keep coming back. Because I was hard on y'all last week. Not Maybe not on y'all, but I was hard on some, some things that are going on in Christendom last, last week. And I take back none of that. But it's hard to believe that the church, quote, would not have God in his right place. But sadly, it is. It's true. Sadly enough. In fact, most of the church world today, organized church world, don't need God. They can run it. They got it together. They've got all the programs. They got it worked out. It's okay, God. You can just sit back and take it easy this week. We got this thing. Mm, don't ever want to be there. I want to be in a place where I am continually seeking his presence and realizing how short I come of his glory and how much I need him. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Hallelujah. Mm, let's get back to it, guys. You see, I like verse 18 and 19. It said, when he got done... He made some more offerings, peace offerings, burnt offerings, and said he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he bought them all lunch. Did you see that? He bought them all lunch. It says here, he says that he distributed to them, both women, women and men, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. Butter Norman, he gave them all a fly pie. That's what he did. How many ever had a fly pie? How many know what a fly pie is? Come on now. Little Debbie makes them. There ain't nothing Little Debbie makes I don't like. We said, y'all can tell. I like everything Little Debbie makes. Fly pie is a little cake with cream in the middle, and it's got raisins in it, and they look like flies. So growing up, we always called them fly pies. So David gave them a fly pie. He gave everybody one. Hallelujah. He blessed them. He bought them lunch. Glory to God. Buy somebody lunch. Take somebody out and buy them lunch. Hallelujah. You'll be blessed in it. Mm. So he bought everybody lunch in verse 19. And in verse 20 it says, He came to bless his house. Came to bless his house. We need to bless our homes as well. Because, see, we need a place of peace, a place of refuge, a hiding place, a place to escape the world, a safe place, sanctuary. That's what our homes need to be. How many of it, too many of us have our homes that have turmoil in them? I own those too sometimes. I tell you what, it would do us good to strive to make our homes a home of peace. That where the peace of God rests. Where people can come home. I mean, most all of us here, in fact, I'd say all of us here, except maybe for some of the ones that are retired, and y'all know what I'm talking about, go to a job, 40-hour a week, or plus, 40-hour a week plus job, and you have to deal with people. You have to deal with people that aren't saved. You have to deal with situations. You have to get this stuff all over you all week long. And all I need is to come home and get the same thing. Come on, somebody. I need to come home and be able to relax. I need to come home and get some peace. Hallelujah. I need to come home and get some relaxation. I need to get home, come home and get some love because I ain't getting it at work. Hallelujah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Lord just spoke to me. He said, there's some people trying to get love at work because they ain't getting none at home. Uh. Glory to God. I ain't in my notes. 
Try to get love at work because they ain't getting it at home. I met my wife at work. <laughs> I, was, I was a young man, <laughs> and, I, and I had plenty of love at the house. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we need a place, our uh, homes need a place, be a place of peace, a place of love. But see, that's not what David got when he went, got, went home, was it? She fussed at him. She complained. She looked down her nose at him. She judged him. Imagine how he felt. The ark comes back to Jerusalem under his leadership the first time in maybe 40 some years. He's excited. He dances before the ark. The people are praising, blowing trumpets. You know, there's an entourage coming into the city. Hallelujah. There's a parade going on. I love a parade. He loves a parade. Glory to God. He comes into town and there's a parade going on. And everybody's excited. You know, he makes burnt offerings. He dances before the Lord with all of his heart. He feeds the people. They all go into their homes blessed. And then he comes back to his house. He's all happy. And who's he meet at the door? I saw you out there today in your underwear dancing around before the young maidens. Yeah, uh uh-huh. That's right. Uh, That's not good. See, he didn't get get a blessing in his own home. But we'll find that what he did in verse 21 is he set her in her place. He said, so David said to Micah, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your daddy and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play before the Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you that are parents and grandparents ever love to have your children play before you. I was sitting there in my chair last night studying the Bible, getting ready. And uh, one of my girls, they're grown up now, was down there talking to my wife and playing some songs on her phone. I could hear them up the hallway. And she played that song uh, by Bob Carlisle, Butterfly Kisses. And she said, that's one of daddy's favorite songs. I heard her. And it just touched my heart because it brought back all those memories when they were sweet little girls and they'd jump up on daddy's lap. Butterfly kisses. That's how Jesus looks at us. He's blessed to see us play before him for we are his children. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But he put her in his place. He said, God has been so good to me, I'm going to play before him. God has been so good to me, I'm going to worship him extravagantly. We need some extravagant worship, folks. Think about it this week. Think about it. Start it this week. Hallelujah. Bring it in here when you come back next week. Hallelujah. He said, I will be held. Well, let me back up. He said, I'll play before him. In verse 22, he says, and I will be even more undignified. I think the King James says vile. I'll be even more vile than thus and humble and will be humble in my own sight. And as far as the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. He said even more. Wow. That's some words that need to be in our vocabulary. Even more. More of you. More of you. I've had all but what I need. Just more of you. Sing it with me. Of things I've had my fill. And yet I hunger still. Empty and bare. Lord, hear my prayer. 
for more of you. Hallelujah. More of you, Jesus. More of you, Jesus. He said, even more. I will be even more vile. He said, I'm going to go even deeper. Hallelujah. That should be the cry of our heart. Lord, I want to go deeper. I want to go to the depths of Christ. Hallelujah. I want to find out what the depths of your glory are. I want to find out what the depths of your presence is. And ain't none of us in here too young or too old for that. And there ain't none of us in here that have arrived yet. I said there ain't none of us in here that have got there. We're supposed to be attaining for this. We're supposed to be striving for this. We're supposed to be living for this to go deeper and know him more. I want to know him more. Hallelujah. And that's what it says. I'm going to go even deeper. And it said, I'll be inhaled by those that are poor in spirit. Those poor maidens, those that are poor in spirit. Hmm. How many know that Jesus talked about the poor in spirit and the Beatitudes? Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. Hallelujah. Who are you trying to appeal to anyway? Who do you want to fellowship with anyway? I don't need somebody that's high and mighty looking down their nose. I don't need, I'm going to tell you what, and uh, Pastor Ronnie would have told you the same thing. It's hard to fellowship sometimes with uh, the district and other preachers. We got a prayer thing coming up here soon. It's going to be held here at our church during the day, during the week, and pastors from the other assembly churches come here. I don't know what to expect, but uh, I have run into some that uh, basically acted like they were too good to talk to you. I don't need that. I ain't too good for nobody because I know who I am. I know who I am, and I know what he brought me from, and I know the pit he pulled me out of. Now, he don't let us forget that. He delivers us from the pit. He delivers us from the condemnation. He delivers us and sets us free, but we don't forget from where he pulled us from. We don't forget what, where, what we were hewn from. Hallelujah. What rock we were chipped out of. Glory to God. I had not forgot that. And if I ever get high-minded, I want somebody out there just to slap me and let me know. Hallelujah. Because we're not going to be that, that way here. We're not going to be looking down our nose at people heady and high-minded. Hallelujah. Verse 23, the last verse of this chapter. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. You think it had anything to do with the way she looked at her husband for praising God? I think so. I think that's exactly what this scripture is telling us. I think because she looked down her nose at him, because she criticized him for doing what God wanted him to do, that she was barren, no fruit, unfruitful. See, things have changed. In that time, this time, and I know that it's still that way somewhat. But in this time, it was very important that women had children. And you were looking at a reproach if you didn't. And that's what she got. She got reproach. She got a reproach. And it wasn't necessarily just because she couldn't have kids. There's a spiritual aspect to it right here. But she, she had reproach because, and she did not bear any children, and she had no fruit because she criticized her husband and looked down on him for doing God's will. You see, last week we saw the actions and the results. We saw the results of the actions of doing the wrong thing, didn't we? We saw what happens. We seen the judgment of God came upon the people of God because they did not follow his instruction and his commandment. Amen? But this week, we see the results of attitudes. Last week were actions. This week's attitudes. We saw the result of attitudes, and the attitudes here brought death and barrenness. So what can we learn from the last two weeks? 
we learn, number one, that doing things God's way brings a blessing. Amen? We learn that when we take a stand for God, there is sometimes opposition. And this opposition can come from your own household. I mean, know the, the devil uses people like pawns sometimes, and they don't realize it. They think me and you are the same. We're all in the same boat. I'm not pointing to the same as other people. Me and you, all of us. There's times we think we have a right to be angry about something or be mad about something or to say something to somebody about something when actually we didn't. And it was the devil prompting us to step out and do the wrong thing and use us in the wrong way. And we let him. Mm -hmm. But thank goodness we have the Spirit of God. And we have discernment. And we need to be sharpening our sense of discernment to recognize when he comes, when it's him and when it's me. Hallelujah. But there'll sometimes be opposition when you take a stand for God. The devil's not going to sit by idly and watch somebody who has an opportunity to change people's lives for the glory of God sit back idly and watch it happen and not do nothing. He's got to try. He's got to step up. Hallelujah. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. I have the King of kings and the Lord of lords living in me. Hallelujah. And giving me the power to overcome. He said he'd make us overcomers. The third thing we can learn, that we take a stand for God, there's opposition. The third thing is when we are critical of those who are sincerely seeking and worshiping God, we suffer the consequence of barrenness. Mm -hmm. No fruit. Or we walk in a barren place. Wow. That comes, that comes home. Walking in a barren place. Barrenness, we're not bearing no fruit. Or barrenness, we're walking in barren places. How many know what a barren place is? It's a place where there ain't nothing. It's like being in the desert. There ain't no water. There ain't no trees. There ain't no fruit. There ain't nothing. And it's dry, and it's thirsty, and it's hard. How many know the Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard? It says there was a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof or death, or destruction. So what do we do? We do things God's way. And we're blessed. When we have opposition that comes at us, we stand in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. With the full armor of God. Hallelujah. And we stand against the opposition. We're not going to be moved. Jesus is my Savior. I shall not be moved in his love and favor. I shall not be moved like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. I ain't going nowhere. And we won't be critical of others, but we'll be supportive. And we'll hold their hands up. Hallelujah. And we're going to worship with them. Glory to God. Mm. Well, we don't have Tammy to come to the piano. Done it again. Keyboard. We don't have Tammy to come to the keyboard. She had to cut out a little early. Bless her heart. We thank her. We appreciate her.